The effective tax rate on hiring a machine rather than a worker for some marginal activity is lower. At the moment, it encourages people to develop and adopt technologies that substitute for human beings rather than complement them in their work. There's no question that AI will increase productivity, but at what cost? How far does it go before we lose our grip on our livelihoods? Not only in manufacturing, but doctors and lawyers. If you take a website like eBay, on eBay every single year, 60 million disputes arise. That is 40 times the number of civil claims that are filed in the entire English and Welsh justice system. It's three times the number of lawsuits filed uh, in the entire US legal system. Uh, they're resolved in this one website every year without any traditional lawyers. And most importantly, 52 million of those 60 million don't require any kind of human mediation at all. So I'm Daniel Suskind. I'm a research professor at King's College London and a senior research associate at the Institute for Ethics in AI at Oxford University. Daniel Siskind has written two thought-provoking books on how AI is changing the nature of work and what tomorrow's labor market might look like. He's also written extensively about the capabilities of technology in economics. Journalist Rhoda Metcalf spoke with Daniel Siskind about his work and AI's growing impact on even the most revered types of work. In the first book that you wrote with your father, Richard Siskind, you look at how AI will impact the professions. So law, medicine, that kind of thing. Now, those are considered the most solid historic jobs out there. But you argue that they're going to be transformed by AI. Why is that going to happen? I suppose the the basic reason why uh, is twofold. One is that when you take any professional job and break it down into all the individual tasks and activities that make it up, uh, the first thing that you see is that even in some of the most expert corners of the labor market, many of those jobs involve relatively routine tasks, relatively straightforward, relatively process-based, and, sure. and, and those sorts of things. The, the, I suppose the second and more challenging idea in that book uh, was that even some of the non-routine tasks, uh, the, the sorts of activities that require faculties like creativity or judgment or even empathy that some of these sorts of activities might also be within reach of... Um, AI. Of AI, exactly. Things like systems that can help you know, make medical diagnoses or systems that can design beautiful buildings or perform you know, very you know, intractable tax uh, calculations. You know, a whole variety of non-routine activity. Uh, and I think, in fairness to us as authors, it's an, it's an idea, an argument that has been borne out over the last decade of technological change. Sure, but I mean, those jobs still exist. People still go into those professions. They go through the same routine of the education that's required to become a doctor or a lawyer or so on. Do you think that that job is going to shrink into something different? Yeah, I th I, so I think what you say is really important, which is that these jobs haven't gone away. And the demand for legal advice, for medical insight, for you know support with your finances and so on, if anything, has, you know, exploded. I think what, what has happened across the professions is that the nature of the work has changed. Can you give me an example of what you're talking about? I'm yeah, so, 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 so one, I mentioned medical diagnosis, for instance. Uh, you know, a team of researchers at Stanford uh, recently announced the development of a system that if you give it a photo of a freckle, it will tell you as accurately as you know, leading dermatologists whether or not that freckle is cancerous, right? A, a remarkable achievement. But what's so interesting, though, if the, if you look at the actual paper uh, that announced this system, the final co-author on that paper was Sebastian Thrun. Uh, now, people who follow artificial intelligence will know that Sebastian Thrun uh, is the computer scientist responsible for developing the first driverless car uh, and one of the leading right. thinkers in the world of computer science today. And and it's just a real insight into how you know, the kind of skills and capabilities required to design this system are very different from the sorts of skills and capabilities that uh, many traditional doctors have been trained in. Um, and it's a story that we see 
across the professions, that very different types of people with very different sets of skills and capabilities are getting involved in, in solving these problems. And, and, you know, one of the arguments why this is important, particularly in the professions, is a sense that our traditional professions are creaking, hmm. uh, that not enough people have access to a good healthcare system. They don't yes. know what their legal entitlements are. They don't know how to manage their financial affairs. And the promise of a lot of these technologies is that they they may offer us far more affordable access right. to the expertise, which in, in the past has only been available to a very privileged and, and lucky few. So there's like the quality of democratization in it. Of, of some of our most expert knowledge. I think that's right. And and one of the motivations actually for writing the book back in 2015, that first book, The Future of the Professions, was actually focused far more on what this meant for consumers and clients and customers and patients mm. and students, you know, what it meant for the end users uh, rather than what it meant for traditional providers. Hmm. Interesting. So yeah. So in your second book, you talk about AI's potential impact on the entire job market. So, mm. I mean, this fear that machines are going to take over our jobs, I mean, that's been around for a long time. But you argue that AI is moving us towards, you know, a new plateau in the world of work. So where do you think it's taking us? Yes, yeah, so I don't think there's going to be some big technological bang when lots of people wake up and find, you know, that they're out of work, you know, robots have taken all the jobs. That is right. really unlikely to happen. Work's going to remain for some time to come. What I worry about is just a more gradual problem, which is that as we move through the 21st century, more and more people are going to find themselves unable to make the sorts of economic contributions to society that they might have hoped or expected to make in the 20th century, given the kind of education that they have, given what they were you know, growing up expecting to do. It's a sort of far less cinematic and far less dramatic picture, but I don't think any less consequential for those who are affected by it. I mean, I think it's also important to bear in mind that, you know, you do not need mass unemployment to present a significant challenge to the way that society is structured. Mm -hmm. um, some people, you know, think that something like technological unemployment is only a problem, you know, when 40, 50 percent of people find themselves without work. I, I think that's completely wrong. I think a story where even 15, 20 percent of people find themselves struggling to, to find work is a really substantial and serious one. And do you think that's what we're moving towards, that kind of a scenario? Th that's the sort of thing that I worry about. And, and where are these people, Where what sort of sectors are they coming out of this 15 to 20 percent? Yeah, you see, and, you know, one of the... One of the unhelpful things that we do when we talk about the future of work, and I've already done this in, in our conversation <laughs> today, is that we tend to talk about the different jobs that people do. Mm -hmm. So we talk about lawyers and doctors and teachers and accountants and so on. But actually, these terms are really unhelpful. And they're, they're unhelpful because you know, it encourages us to think of the work that people do as being a kind of monolithic, indivisible lump of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and that the way technology affects the labor market is by you know, removing those particular you know, jobs. Yeah, exactly. Destroying certain jobs and creating entirely new ones. But yeah. that isn't actually what, what happens. What it does is it, it displaces us from particular tasks and activities, but it also makes other tasks and activities, you know, more valuable and more important. So you get perhaps this, that particular job still exists, but you only have one person where they used to have five people doing that job. Correct. And in turn, the nature of that job looks very different too. And to some extent, in, in some of the occupations, the, the, the number of those jobs has changed as well. Uh, and, and that's the sort of story that I think we'll see over time. Hmm. So you're talking about sort of the wealthy, technologically advanced countries. I mean, how how about the developing world, Africa, for example, you know, which is dominated by low-skilled workers? Have you thought at all about how AI might impact that part of the world? Yeah, it's very interesting. And I, th I think it's just, it's very, very uncertain. Uh, and, and the main reason it's uncertain is this. If you look at the kind of activities that tend to be concentrated in the sorts of economies you're describing, many of the jobs in those labor markets involve routine activities. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, you know, so you've got the fact that the work lends itself to automation, but on the other hand, you've got the fact that the relatively low labor costs creates an incentive to use workers rather than machines. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it might be that in many of these you know, less developed countries, although technologies are available to automate the work that 
you know, large parts of the labor market do. It just doesn't make economic sense because, you know, compared to the relatively low cost of labor, these machines just are are too expensive. You know, you can you can see this sort of tension playing out a little bit as countries develop. So sure. it's not a coincidence, for instance, that in China, there's over the last 15 years or 20 years now, mm -hmm. there's been a, a huge amount of investment and development in sort of robotics for manufacturing and, and warehouses. And it's, and it's because, you know, 20 years ago, China's economic competitive advantage came in part from the relatively low no labor cost of all the workers that had come from rural areas to urban areas in search of work. But with that relative labor cost advantage eroded by rising real wages over the last you know 20 years or so, there's now been a very strong incentive in China to develop the sorts of technologies that might you know replace that relatively more expensive labor now. So, I mean, this movement towards a, a highly technologically advanced world in which so many of these jobs are taken over by AI, I mean, is this a runaway train that's unstoppable? Or how do we steer it in a direction so that, you know, so that AI continues to make us more productive, as it, as it certainly does, but without taking over our world of work? Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm not a technological determinist. I don't think that technological progress has to be a certain way. You know, I think by shaping the incentives that people face in, in their working lives, we can change the nature of the particular technologies that get developed. I mean, just two examples. One from the US, it's particularly striking. Uh, but various researchers have looked at the, the US tax code and have identified that the, the US tax code creates a pretty strong incentive for people to develop technologies that automate the work that people do. Hmm. Now, if you hire a machine, for instance, you don't have to pay payroll tax. Right. The, the effective tax rate on hiring a machine rather than a worker for some marginal activity is lower. Hmm. At the moment, it encourage, encourages people to develop and adopt technologies that substitute for human beings rather than complement them in their work. And you, know, you, could, you could imagine a situation in which you change those incentives so that the opposite is the case. Right. Another setting where you can think about how we might change incentives is in the world of computer science itself. You know, the, the, the benchmark that people use in computer science for success is human parity. The moment that a system is celebrated is when it can outperform a human being. Right. You know, a, a medical diagnostic system is held up as a triumph when it outperforms a human doctor. Yeah. Uh, you know, a, a system in architecture sure. is celebrated when it designs a more beautiful building. You yeah. know, that's the moment you get the headline in the newspaper. That's the moment you get the slap on the back from the colleague. You know, that's the moment you get the research funding. And so, again, you can think about how you might be able to change that incentive in the world of computer science to encourage researchers to develop technologies that complement rather than substitute for human workers. To make, make humans more productive, to, to enhance what they can do. That's exactly right, rather than replace them. Mm -hmm. I suppose the sort of deeper question and the more profound question is, do we necessarily want to do that? Is a world with less work necessarily something to be afraid of. I mean, certainly now, you're, many people talk about a four-day work week, you know, a shorter work week, you know, right. working less. But I think there's a big difference between working less and not working at all. Right, right. right. I, I think one's answer to this question about whether or not a world with less work is something to be frightened of, afraid of, depends in part of how we respond to that challenge. Are we able to change our institutions in such a way that we can support people in flourishing in a world where work might play a less central role. Because certainly, I mean, as it stands right now, where you stand in the world, how much income you have depends on the work you do, how much work you do. I th I th yeah, I think you're exactly right. You've hinted at what I think are the two big challenges that we face in a world with less work. One is the sort of economic challenge. How do we share our income in society? if we're no longer able to rely upon the labor market to do it. Yeah. So on the one hand, there's the sort of the distribution challenge. And, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence that worries about inequality are intensifying today at exactly the same time that these sorts of worries about automation and structural technological unemployment are growing. You know, the two problems are very closely related. Mm -hmm. But there's also another challenge, which is quite different, and it has far less to do with economics. And it's the challenge of 
meaning and purpose. You know, it's often said that work isn't simply a source of income. It's also a source of status and direction and fulfillment right. and, and purpose and meaning. And, and if that's right, the challenge of a world with less work isn't just that it might hollow out the labor market, leaving some people without an income, but it might also hollow out that sense of, of meaning in life. So, I mean, what's the government's role in all of this? I mean, as as all of this begins to play out and as we try and figure out how, how we're going to navigate this changing world of work, what does a government do? I mean, with respect to the economic challenge, I think, you know, in, in my view, the only response is for the state to take a larger role in sharing out income in society. It's the only right. alternative. More redistribution. Mechanism. Yeah, and, and I write in, in A World Without Work about the big state, uh, which I think terrifies some people, but it's important to... To note that the, when I talk about a big state, I don't mean teams of smart people sitting in central government offices trying to command and control economic affairs from a distance. I think many countries around the world tried that and it failed miserably. Sure. Um, I instead have in mind a big state of distribution, a state that takes on a larger role in sharing our income in society when we can't rely on the labor market to do it. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that's probably a, a fairly familiar idea I think the the more uncomfortable and less familiar idea is what what we do in response to this meaning problem. You know, how do we provide meaning and purpose to to people when when work no longer sits at the center of their lives? And essentially, the argument I make is that all if if you know in the twentieth century we developed a whole variety of labor market policies to shape people's working lives. If leisure takes on a larger role in people's lives in the future, then we're also going to want to have leisure policies as well. Okay. In other words, the state is going to have to take a larger role in shaping our, our non-working lives too. Hmm. That might sound relatively absurd at a distance, but part of the argument I'm trying to make is that, well, look, the state already does this. It just does it in a very haphazard and, and not particularly thoughtful way. You know, In the UK, for instance, we have the Department for uh, Culture, Media and Sport, which, right. among other things, you know, encourages all children in the country to learn to swim and ride a bike. It, it makes, you know, access to, you know, libraries and museums to people, uh, you know, available to for free. It, it intervenes in various ways to shape people's non-working lives. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I, I don't think the idea is quite as, as radical as it might seem at first. It makes me also wonder about other players in the work world now. I mean, labor leaders, unions. I mean, are they going to play any kind of a role in all of this? I, I, I think they. I think they really do. And um, the, the the great economist J.K. Galbraith once spoke about this idea of countervailing power. And I think at a, a, a time when these increasingly capable technologies are creeping into more and more areas of our lives and the large technology institutions who are responsible for building them become more and more powerful, there is an important, a really important role for unions in helping kind of disparate workers band together and exert, you know, countervailing power against this, you know, these increasingly powerful, you know, large technology companies and increasingly capable uh, technologies. But to um, one end, but to what end? I mean, what are they fighting for? One obvious one is, you know, worker pay. Uh, another is the quality of work. You know, we spent a lot of time today talking about the quantity of work that will have to be done in the future. But one important worry is how these technologies erode the quality of work as well. Right. So maybe also the idea of instead of replacement, pressing more for technologies to complement workers and not to replace them. Exa exactly. Yeah. Um, now, th there's a question about, again, I sort of hinted at before, whether or not you think it's just sort of delaying the inevitable. But even if you think that's right, making the sort of the transition, the journey to a world with less work as as comfortable and as pleasant and as prosperous as it can be for workers, I think is a, a, a good goal for, for unions to have. So, I mean, finally, if you were starting out in college today, knowing yeah. what you know now, yeah. would it be more difficult to choose your career path, do you think? I really think it depends what you want to do. If I was talking to an aspiring professional, for instance, mm -hmm. I'd still continue on the traditional path. I'd still go to a law school or a medical school or an architecture school, or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason I say that is because when you look at many of the institutions using technology to solve these problems in the professions uh, in very different ways, often what you see at the helm is 
yes, there is a you know a technical expert, someone who knows a lot about computer science who can code and so on. But you also have domain experts as well, whether it's a medical startup or a law startup or a accountancy tech startup or you know whatever it might be. You see people who know a lot about the technologies, but also people who know a lot about the domain, who know a lot about the law, know a lot about medicine, know a lot about architecture, mm -hmm. whatever. And the best place to learn about the domain of each of these professions remains the traditional professional training institutions. Right. So my first piece of advice would be take the traditional path for now. But what I would also say is that, you know, as you move through your career, be far more open-minded and far more agnostic about where you might move in the world of work at any particular moment. You know, the idea that the only career path in the world of law, for instance, is to move up through one particular law firm through your career, through your life, I think is a mistake. There are lots of exciting and interesting lateral moves that you can make to to very different types of institutions and working with very different types of people. But also, you know, at the end of the day, solving the same sort of legal problems that that in the past very particular types of lawyers alone might have solved. Hmm. Interesting. Well, Daniel Siskind, you've given us a lot to think about. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Not at all. Such a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Daniel Siskind is a research professor at King's College London and a senior research associate at the Institute for Ethics in AI at Oxford University. He's also the author of A World Without Work and co-author with his father, Richard Siskind, of The Future of the Professions. And be sure to check out the December edition of the IMF's Finance and Development magazine for a deep dive into how artificial intelligence is changing our economic lives. Go to imf.org slash FND. You can hear more IMF podcasts on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. You can also follow us on X, what used to be Twitter, at IMF underscore podcast. I'm Bruce Edwards. And I'm Rhoda Metcalf. Thanks for listening.